I have a very special guest, Susan Winter, with me today. Susan has been on Oprah, and she is a best-selling author and relationship expert, and she specializes in higher thinking for today's evolving world. She writes, she speaks, and coaches on partnership models and thought systems by which to access our inherent magnificence. And I just spent uh, last night, I've seen all her videos, I think, and I spent last night listening to uh, The Cure for Heartache. I loved it. Thank you, Mary. So absolutely great. The other books, too, I'm going to be reading Allowing Magnificence. But You'll like that one. I, you know, you, I loved hearing you speak. It was absolutely great. So I'm going to jump right in and, um, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was what's the, what is one of the issues that comes up the most often with relationships that you see in your counseling and, and your career? Tell us about that. Uh, Many different formats, uh, the way it's approached, but normally it's a discontent that you either, somebody contacts me because it's not going well with the person they love, or they're trying to get that person back into their lives. Mm. They're in New York, at least on the East Coast. They're, uh, the hottest topic for me this year with clients has been how to get your ex back. And and by the way, mm. I want to make these are men. These are men, not women, men. Oh. Women in on the East Coast, my East Coast clients are how to get into partnership because men in New York City are so resistant. They don't need to. Let's let's figure it out. I mean, <laughs> sex is now given freely. There is no incentive to partner. And guys are having a field day. Yet on the West Coast, my clients on the West Coast, the men are seriously looking for women oh. that are flakes. And the women on the West Coast, I think as an outcome of Los Angeles pickup artists, the 15 years we've had of all the games they've been playing with women Mm -hmm. that have infiltrated all the male coaching uh, seminars and all the things that you see online and all the books and all the podcasts. The women are tired of being roadkill. They're tired of the revolving door (laughs) of sexuality. Young women, especially the millennials, have pretty much given up, you know, like, okay, men are for sex. Maybe I get a dinner out of it if I'm lucky. I'm just going to focus on my career. And then my international clients kind of mirror some aspect of that. So getting into partnership feels more complicated for us today because of open sexuality and all the free dynamics. We don't have the roles and labels and formats. And then if you have been lucky enough to find a relationship and it escapes you for some reason or other, people are desperate to return to an ex because I think, you know, most of us leave an ex or have an ex leave us. We get over it and they're an ex for a reason. But people that are younger may not have experienced this, gone through the cycles of long-term relationships as much and they found somebody and they don't want to let go. So those are my two to, those are the two entry points. But that's so interesting that it's so different from the East and West Coasts. I find that too. I find that too. And the only correlation that I can think of are the pickup artists because I actually knew one of the original pickup artists. And I had this young man took me to dinner and I had a four hour conversation on female psychology, male psychology. If men only knew this about us, they could get away with murder. I'm thinking I'm having the most exciting conversation in my life. (laughs) Did I know that I was planting the seeds of the psychological warfare that these guys were going to use? I had no idea. Wow. He hadn't moved out to LA. He hadn't started that work yet. He knew he was going there. But I, I should have figured it's either four hours with Charlie Rose or a kid pummeling me for information. And I just didn't think it through. I just I thought, what a great conversation. This is a great dinner. We're very good friends now, by the way. He's married and has his first child. Wow. So these guys do evolve in time. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Also great. Well, another thing that hit me uh, listening to your book, the audio book of uh, The Cure for heartache was the last chapter. It was my favorite one about um, you own the bank. Will you talk a little bit about that? That was beautiful. Um, 
I had actually, I, so I, there are about 600 pages of a book that I never released mm. about 10 years ago. And that was in, that concept was in one of my chapters. And I thought, you can wait for publishers to understand what you're saying, or you can just tell people. But if I remember heartache correctly, the initial feeling to a naive person entering heartache is that all you know is you were happy when you were with them, mm -hmm. they walked away, and now you're not happy. So it appears as though they've trotted off with all your happiness, all your love, all your joy, all your future <laughs> dreams. It really looks that way to the casual eye. Mm -hmm. Till you think it through and you realize, oh my goodness, I'm the only one that could have ever experienced the sense of love. The, you know, when you start to realize that the only one loving was you, yes, mm -hmm. your partner may have been loving. Your partner inspired you to let go and experience your own love. But we know, we've met people that no matter what great parents they have or partner, they just can't feel love because they don't have it inside them. You can love them to death and it's just like it doesn't resonate. Mm -hmm. So the act of love is something that is inside of us that we experience and we we attribute it to the object of our desire because it appears to be so, but that's not the case. And the way I discovered this is I was dating a player for research, mm -hmm. thinking I'd never fall for him. And of course, half my age, no <laughs> skill set. You know, it, it should have been, I, I thought he couldn't hurt me because I thought there's no way I can, well, Susan being Susan, of course, I fell in love with him. And I'm standing in my windowsill and I talk about this in, yes. in the audio booklet. And I could literally see the, the rooftop of his apartment building. And I kept thinking, he's not here. Why do I have this feeling? I, I just, this love is just, and he's not here. And yet I feel it and then I miss him and I want it. And I suddenly had that aha moment. It's my love. I'm. He's not here. I'm still having this feeling. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! It's originating within me, yeah. and yeah. that was that was the kicker. That suddenly, at least the intellectual level had satisfied this answer. The human is still going through it. The human is going through their emotions and their withdrawal and their anger and their sorrow, but the observer part of me understood that it is my love. And then the secondary kick was, oh my goodness, I've been waiting for this guy's little measly deposit stub, but I own the bank. I own the <laughs> bank of my love. What was I thinking? I can love anyone I want. If the love's coming from me and he trotted off, he didn't leave with my ability to love. I still have it and I can love this guy or that guy or this woman or that woman or that dog and this country. I can love whatever I want. Mm -hmm. so that was the empowering moment for me. Well, you you made it so visual. And, you know, I think you hit the crux of the heartache where you finally see, oh, okay, it's me. I mean, each step was great. But that one being the last I loved because it it made you really see that you have the love inside you. And you can hear that a million times. But your visual of looking out and seeing his roof, I loved it because you know, we, it, we you can get co so caught up in thinking that it's such a bad thing that it happened, but it, you made it. So, you made it in a practical way. People can. Uh, I I it, I recommend everybody get that. It's so sweet. Cure for heartache because it, it just is perfect because it gives you practical steps. Mary, whenever I write, whenever I talk, whenever I do an audio booklet, I I have an idea in mind that I want to harness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my readers, my viewers, uh, even my clients into this. Um, it's a progressive thing where you start to give the examples, give the solutions, give the examples, give the solutions. And then the end message by what I try to do is create an emotional connection, like a heartbeat, connection to their heartbeat between the language and everything so that when the big information comes, it's easily digestible because to, that the, so that's why those seven steps each one was like okay we you're going to see yourself do this okay you're going to see yourself do that mm -hmm. you do this you do that but it has to be a philosophical end point to to wrap the whole thing up because you have the tangible steps that you take in life the action steps but if they're not grounded 
in the deep-rooted philosophical agreement with that concept. It doesn't hold. No. That's, you know, it's like Arthur Murray dancing class. You've seen those <laughs> couples that you, they, they're counting out loud. Yes. It's moving beautifully, but it's studied. Then there's the kind where it's organic. And what I've learned with all my clients is that I have to appeal to their disposition. Whatever I say, however mm -hmm. I frame it, if I want them to move psychologically and emotionally to a better spot, it is my job to find a language, find the way to allow them to understand it so that it agrees with their knowing. So, it, for example, I had a girlfriend who, um, she, had a, she had a hard task. She wanted to manifest something that she'd never experienced or seen. Mm. She wanted to experience a true loving partnership. Didn't have it with her parents didn't have it with her siblings, could kind of see it in, t in movies, but it's not the same. So she didn't have a working, tangible experience. And she kept letting this guy step all over her. And she read that book, uh, Why Men Love Bitches, Why Men Want Bitches. <laughs> okay, so dispositionally, she said, Susan, I don't want that energy. I want to be able to love. I don't want to be a bitch. I don't want to be selfish. I don't like that about people. She said, so everything I'm hearing to make my correction tells me to be a person I don't want to be. Mm. And I said, okay, so I knew where her heartbeat was. So then the goal is how can I find an argument that her mind will agree with, her soul will agree with, that will get her in the same healthy place. So I said, okay, do you believe that we are all responsible for our own emotional reaction? She said, absolutely. And the choices you make that you've made in life, you're responsible for where you've ended up. It's not them, it's not them, right? And she said, yes. And I said, then you're being, um, having boundaries and, ha and having a sense of who you are is your responsibility and how your partner reacts to it is theirs. Mm -hmm. So you do understand that. And she, the light bulb kind of went off that it's okay to be loving and have boundaries. That was a, the seduction into her empowerment to not harm anyone, but that everybody's responsible for their own feelings and reactions. And she's in right order to begin with. So that agreed with her and she could absorb it. Well, one of the things that I so love about you is that you combine the spiritual with the practical. It's got to be that. Don't you think, Mary? Oh, totally. I mean, and I just, I think that you get into ideologies with like religion or this psychological method, but they're never hard. So rarely are they together to really practically help you without having a label of one religion or another or this method. And that's what is so great about you, that everybody that really wants to work on themselves it's accessible and just you know seeing you on YouTube and all of the videos that you've done they're very to the point and really practical and something you can do right away that's what I that's what is so great Mary I love you you are basically that's my intention and if you're telling me that my intention because I like quick information yeah the point you can apply it today and it agrees with your mentality and you feel good at the end of it Oh, that's I, the I, other I, thing. I like I, I give happy endings. Yes, yeah. I like to do that. <laughs> I, I mean, I try because it's, you know, somebody is watching you because they have an issue and you want them to feel happy at the end, right? You, so you try and encourage them and, and you make it make sense, not just like, oh, be hopeful, have faith. It's like, ugh, right. that, what does that mean? You've yeah. got to really, you know, show them the reason why this is hopeful. Give them the reason why you can have faith, right? Well, and the actual steps, because, you know, you can hear letting go and allow this and all this. But if you don't have a step to take, that's why I thought the cure for heartache was so good, because you're actually saying, okay, practical steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, that gives people, and you said it in the book, a, a way to get out of it and it's numbered with bullet yeah. points. Like, that's just what everybody needs. But I think people kind of don't really grasp that unless they have an actionable plan. I agree because, you know, you've got to take the physical world, the action plan, and merge it with the mental, spiritual, emotional, psychological. And when you marry the two together and make it practical, make it understandable. 
make it so that people understand. Which people are amazing at getting concepts, yeah. big concepts that are going to shift their entire being if you can make it applicable. Mm -hmm. So the emergency phone call that I had with my client right before uh, we got on the phone, which kind of s s just that took me a little bit more time to set all this up. Uh, this gal dates world-class men. I mean, world-class. The kind that, you know, you'd see on Charlie Rose uh -huh. or that might be Davos. Now, these <laughs> guys are the ultimate sharks, right? Yeah. So she's a place to be with one of them. She kind of doubts what he says. These guys, some of them, not all of them, but the group that she's met, they don't do monogamy. They don't, you know, they do they this girl. They don't have to. They don't have to, right. So she found a few discrepancies <laughs> that this guy had said, and okay. she was getting she was getting all upset and like going to talk to him and have a whole thing about it. Uh -huh. I said to her, "Look, you knew what you had. You knew what he was. That's like you getting upset. You saw the sign that said no lifeguard on duty. Swim at your own <laughs> risk. And you went out there and you got bitten by something, and you were mad at the ocean. A shark. Yeah, got bit by a shark." He is what he is. This I love is why, that. Why are you doing that? Because if you can make it, as she laughed, she was so tense and so worried. And I'm like, enjoy this. I said, look, it. you've got a couple isolated days with this man as he makes his rounds through the world. And he decided to see you. I'm sure there are dozens of other women in that city. Oh, my God. And I said, so look at it like if you like him, here's how to do it. I used to be on uh, always on a diet, and then once in a while you have a cheat day. So <laughs> if you have a cheat day, you don't want somebody saying, oh, that's got so many calories, right. or do you feel guilty tomorrow? No. Cheat day is I'm all in. I'm going to eat it. When I'm done, it's done. Chocolate feel, cake. Bring it on. Exactly. He's her chocolate cake. She gets a couple couple days with him. I said, enjoy him like your chocolate cake. Oh, wow. Don't eat it. Don't feel guilty about it. When he leaves, okay. you and I might want to talk about, is this prototype that you're going for in your best interest? Because you like it, but you got complaints. They're not, right. all, they're not all philanderers, okay? Not every man with money and, and world power is that. Some are. What is it about you that wants that one? Because if you think you can tame the wild horse, that is a... That's something women have been trying to figure out for years and never, and men too. And I think some, Annette Benning did it though. <laughs> I know. Warren and Beatty. She waited till he was older and harder to catch. That's, he wasn't so you're fast. Right. She didn't try and get him at 25, 30, 35. You're or right. 40. You're right. But you know, on this point, this is so interesting because I found uh, when I first started dating, uh, here I am in the epicenter of Silicon Valley. And so I'd have these millionaires hitting on me but they weren't even available. I, I knew that it would just be one of many kind of thing. And so I was like, no way. I didn't want that. No, so it's interesting that you bring that up because it's a more practical way. Like if you're going, okay, you're right. You can't say everybody is like that. But what would you say about, you know, just kind of, well, one of your videos I've, I liked a lot. I saw it last night. The difference between settling and uh, being uh, realistic. Oh, you that know, was this morning. Yes. That was this morning. Talk, I really Talk that. a little bit about that. That's a really fascinating topic. Okay. So um, many of these, Mary, are in response to a direct question that I get on YouTube or mm -hmm. somebody will write me on Facebook, which is great. You give me more topics. The per, uh, I had had one on uh, why you will settle for less, mm -hmm. certain conditions that would make you settle for less than your optimal, but they're logical. Just know you're doing it. That yes. was it. So somebody said, I love this video, but can you tell me, how do I know the difference between settling and being realistic? Mm -hmm. I realized that the difference is, if you're settling, you are consciously aware that you are making upfront sacrifices and compromises, and that you really do know you could have done better. Conversely, being realistic means that you are looking at every factor in your life and every condition perhaps a limited pool of mm -hmm. partners from whom to select. Perhaps there are certain conditions about your life, your travel lifestyle, the way you are, that you're a recluse, that you're on the computer 12 yeah. hours a day, that you need to run for six hours every day, something <laughs> about you yeah. that you know, kind of separates you, narrows the prospective pool of mates. 
if you look at all those things and you start to being realistic is, okay, I know this, 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 and this about my life. Mm -hmm. So given these factors and my own peculiarities, I know that I may have a more specific but smaller pool from whom to look for as a romantic mate. So then the realistic choice is to say, what is my best choice out of all the possibilities that I have in front of me? Remember, settling is you knew you could have done more. You're just lazy. You're not into it. It's not your focus. Why not stay with him? He doesn't bother me. <laughs> Next year, you know, whatever. Um, and there's such a fine line with that. Well, you do know, though, ultimately, because okay. settling that there is that uncomfortable feeling that you can't repress. Kind of like you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, God, that's right. This is my life. What am I doing? <laughs> you know, like, you know, you know, you're settling when you pray he's going to die in his sleep because you don't have to do it. You don't have to be done with him. You just want out of that relationship. Oh, my God. And settling can be difficult because sometimes it's not bad, but it's certainly not great. Yeah. And for whatever reason, it's either comfortable, there could be extenuating circumstances. Maybe you need to take care of a sick mother and he's got all the resources and you dump him if you could, but you have to stay there. So maybe you don't like the way he treats you. Maybe you don't like the way he smells. You don't like the way he, I don't know, clips his toenails. Oh, man. But smell. But, but what well, smell? Oh, the big <laughs> That's thing so thing. important. Well, for me it is, yeah. And, uh, you know, it has to be an agreeable smell to me. Um, but so settling means you have an ongoing sense of mild to average discontent. And okay. and being realistic means um, I understand that I have some limitations to my selection pool. But out of all of these people, I am going to find the one that's most agreeable that I enjoy. That's being smart. Well... I think as intelligent as you can be. I mean, it, you do have to approach it in a very practical way, this emotional stuff. I mean, this is the thing that affects us the most, relationships. It does, isn't it? Yeah. I think relationships are the ultimate um, extreme sport. I have long thought this. Uh, so that book that's just over 600 pages still sitting in this computer, uh, I had written that I found it amusing as an American citizen to watch our enthusiasm for these extreme sports, whether it's this, mm -hmm. you know, mixed martial arts where they've got one ear coming off and blood coming from everywhere, <laughs> or it's the guys, okay, who's the guy, Lance, uh, no, is it? Lance uh, Armstrong, who's, the biker. Uh, Hamilton, who's Lar Laird Hamilton? Oh, yes. I, they airdrop him from a helicopter onto like a hundred foot wave. Oh my God. I didn't know. He married Gabby Reese, uh, the volleyball person. At any rate, he chases the biggest waves. And it's so beyond, his extreme is so beyond that you don't just like paddle out and catch a wave. <laughs> they drop him out of a helicopter. Oh my God. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so. That's crazy. What people do in okay. extreme sports, black diamond uh, skiing, whatever. Yeah. But ask those same individuals, hey, why don't you just let go and fall in love? Oh, no, 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 no. I might get hurt. I might oh, get hurt. Right? But that's true. That's uh, it, the absolute truth. This is where we are deficient. This is why intellectuals have long poo-pooed love. Mm. Because they just don't want to deal with it. It's messy. It's human. It's whatever. It's reactive. We don't do that. We're above the fray. No, you're terrified. It is a it is a full on full contact extreme sport that people are more terrified of that than almost anything else. Yeah, I think actually with the people that I've known and, and this took me a long time to figure out with feelings and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Um, it's really difficult to get um, men to talk about their feelings and you don't want to feel like you're pulling it out of them, you know, by the teeth. It what. Can you talk a little bit about that? Depends upon a man's age, and I say that only, yeah. generally speaking, the younger generations are the recipients of greater emotional awareness. Yes. They've been reprogrammed by society. We've dropped it into them. Mm -hmm. They've dropped, you know. You've got to understand, one, a man may not know what he's feeling. Well, that's true, and that is helpful to hear that. 
Most of them don't. Yeah. But there are a lot of women who don't know what they're feeling. That's true. They feel anxiety. They feel anxious. They feel depressed. They can't. They might generally pin the tail on the donkey and like, I don't my job. But they don't. They can't really dissect what it is. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if a man doesn't express himself, start from the one possibility is he may not know. Yeah. If a man, if you're asking a man to express his emotions around you, very few men are verbal in this way. I find men to be more action oriented, that a man will show you long before he tells you, unless he's a poet or an artist, you know, they, they might speak, use language. Don't you find men show you in action? Well, yes. Helping, Helping us, right? Yeah. They help us. How are you doing? How can I save you? How can I help you? A manly man could save you. And but I they, love that about them. <laughs> oh, I, I, that's the, basically, that and sex, I mean, that's that's their dominant. Those are their two home run categories. Those are two good home runs. I agree. So, okay, that's a good way to look at it. In fact, that took me so long to figure that out, that they don't know they might not. what they're feeling. That they, I mean, they might not. And, and well, it depends what they're feeling philosophically, emotionally in their life. They can tell you how they felt about the football game or how they felt about the contractor that they could have done it better. Yes. Or they can tell you, you know, give you advice on something. But it's been an historical disconnect between a man's feelings and his acknowledgement of this. But purposefully, you know, remember, we sent them out as our hunters and our fighters. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine you say, by the way, when you're going to kill that deer, connect with yourself. What do you feel about that? <laughs> That's so funny. But you know, I really think it, it, it takes raising children differently because I see it with my own son that, you know, like he's empowering women in Nepal. He started this whole foundation. And, and he really, he, he, I think you have to really teach and that's why the younger ones, just what you yep. said, the younger ones have more. And I have found that, too, have more of a sensibility. I mean, it isn't just him. It's so many people, guys that are like between 25 and 35 that have a lot more. And, and I have friends from that age group, too. So, I mean, one of the things that surprised me when I first became single was that there's a lot of younger guys that really are more interested in someone who's mature and, and can be a full woman. I mean, that's been... A beautiful thing to to know. talk a little bit about that. I know you've written a lot about it, and I just love your videos about that. But there was nobody to go to when I first started dating younger guys. So me too, me too. Uh, my first experience was 1991, and I didn't know. Well, I didn't even know what internet was. <laughs> right? I didn't have a computer. I didn't yeah. work in an office where I might know how to do something. Um, What you're talking about, I think, uh, you're talking about the idea that now younger men acknowledge uh, value and are free to desire an older woman romantically. Yeah, Yeah. that's a real real cultural shift. Mm -hmm. I believe that the young men who take an upfront buy of an older woman, meaning she's got some wrinkles, she's got some this, she's got some that, they are looking for content. Yeah real content and uh, a self-possessed woman that knows who she is, knows what she wants, knows how to tell them what she wants and doesn't play games. Yeah, That's the mantra they tell me. 200 men, almost exactly. She knows what she wants. She doesn't play games. She knows what she wants. They said it in their own way or those exact words. And so for men to have a manual on how to treat us mm-hmm. and handle us, because so many times women, especially when we're younger, we are vague. We are confused. Oh, yeah. We turned game. If we're jealous, we act like we don't care. If we like him, we <laughs> act like we didn't notice him. I mean, no wonder men are confused because yeah. we are our, our natural signals because they make us uncomfortable. So I, I love that we are living in a time period where younger men are seeing, I think, perhaps maybe a beauty that we struggle to find within ourselves. Oh, that's I, beautiful. I wake up and I look in the mirror and I go, oh, God, not again. Please. And I throw <laughs> my glasses. And it's even worse. 
And I'm like, okay, I need a farsighted man. I need a farsighted <laughs> man. That's what I want. Because I, I mean, it's like, and in New York, you know, I've got these Hollywood lights in the back. Oh my God. I've got all these magnifying mirrors, but how beautiful that they don't care. Yeah. They, they really well, don't. They're more gracious than I am. Definitely. I care. I mean, I, you know, so that was my goal was to see, that was a very uh, controversial conversation when the, when older women, younger men came out in 2000, Mary, what was controversial mm -hmm. is that it was about love. That pissed they me off so bad. I know. It was, I had something to fight for. Uh, they didn't care if it's just casual sex. As a matter of fact, they didn't even care if you, as the older, more powerful person, were going in with an agenda to hurt and abuse somebody because it was only sexual, right? But if you made it, I love this person, that's when everybody freaked out. That is atrocious. Right. No, I found that too. My own friends would be like, he's too young for you. But you know, talking about that, um, well, there's two more things on it. So the feelings, I find that um, I was kind of shocked by people's lack of uh, caring about people's feelings. Uh, and, and so, you know, w talk a little bit about how I, I just feel like we could be, we could have more manners <laughs> in how we deal with people. Are you, are you talking about in general or about the older woman, younger man situation? Well, people? well, people just really in general, I would say about dating in, in particular, just in how people regard each other. Like just what you said about the, if it was casual sex, then it's okay. But then, you know, even if you start that way, it can turn into love. And I know. Then, you know, That's how do you deal with that? Yeah, isn't it funny that the most intimate act in the world can actually be a little emotional? <laughs> <laughs> who knew? Isn't right? that crazy? It can activate emotions. It oh, can't be knew? neutral. The thing that gives and creates life might have some emotional depth to it. Oh, exactly. Wow. Um, oh, asking us all to be kind and appreciative. <laughs> right? Okay, so you have to start with a person who's fairly conscious of what they're doing. Right. When I was in high school, I hurt my boyfriend, Aww. and I because I I was a loving person. I loved my parents. I loved my horse. I loved my dog, mm. but I didn't get what was going on. Mm. And I guess that was his first puppy love, and I kind of was very cavalier. And then I went with somebody else, and then and then I went back to him, and then I didn't say much about it, and then I went off with somebody else. I mean, I was you know not a very but I'd never had my heart broken. Oh yeah. And then when he finally wouldn't take me back, the one who'd always take me back, I was hurt and it cracked. And of course I thought I was gonna die. I wrote these poetic letters. I know I'm dying. I can feel it inside. I mean, oh, I was yeah. in So I literally thought I was dying. It was like, it was so dramatic. And he wouldn't take me back. He loved me, but he wouldn't take me back. Mm -hmm. That's when I thought, wow. I know what that feels like. I am never going to do that to anybody. Never, ever. And you can't. Once no. you feel that you really can't, unless you're really a little twisted and you decide to use that to harm everybody else. But that's a very small fraction of the population is really mentally to that point that they're so sick that they'd want to then take their hurt and then hurt everybody else. But I think we, you don't know the power of love until you've, had your heart crack a little bit and then you're a little bit more empathetic oh, and I wish something. we and I wish we all would have better manners yeah. all of it, you know um it, it just straight across the board do you remember there was a, tw a tweet that was going around it was so great I'm paraphrasing it but it was something like manners have become so rare yeah that they are assumed to be flirtation <laughs> that's true that's true I, uh, but is that? Is I that think it's true because you know, just switching from Hawaii to California, people are a little more guarded here. But in Hawaii, everyone says you can spot a tourist instantly because they're guarded. But if you're a resident, everybody smiles and says hello. But that could be mistaken for being hit on. Yeah. Here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, and another thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, I loved your video about. Uh, 
when you called after, um, you know, how you can think, oh, the guy's supposed to call first after you've been intimate. And oh, I nearly lost a boyfriend. See, that's so great. Oh, gen it was generational. Uh, so I was, uh, what was I like 16 years older than he was. I didn't know. Yeah, I wouldn't have known. That once he slept with a woman, they'd start chatting and texting and come, what are you doing? When am I going to see you? What's going on? Hey, hey, how are you? I didn't do that. I was like, okay. Yes, it's a, it was a generational misunderstanding. But we, but here's, so here's my greater concern. Okay. With all these old rules yeah. that sometimes they're, sometimes they're worth keeping and other times they're really worth discarding. Yes. And all these new rules that are being made up by the participants of this new game, mm -hmm. which are sometimes okay and sometimes just a patch job, not well thought through, I think we have to be more creative, yes. individual, to take responsibility, to look at what's happening in a relationship, what we're feeling, what we want, and go off our own cues, not Definitely. their cues. Not what our peer group tells us is okay. Mm -hmm. I remember the the player that I was crying about and but got the aha moment. Yeah. Or after he taken me out to dinner for the first time, he dropped flowers off at my um, wow. at my building. Oh, he was really doing it up properly and <laughs> making a good impression. And he called me on the phone. He said, and he said to me something I'd never heard. He said, uh, "I know I shouldn't call because I mean, you know, I know the two day rule." And I thought. I said, what's the two-day rule? He said, oh, well, you're not supposed to call a girl for two days after you've gone out with her. I said, oh, who boy. made that up? And he said, I don't know, but that's just what they say. I'm like, who told you that? Yeah. Who made that a thing? You know, who? Just Where did like, that come from? I don't know, but it's that's a dumb one. And just because somebody imposed that upon you, how is that any different than some other structure that you found confining? Maybe the cardboard cutout pre-dictated pre, pre roles of what a husband and a wife should be, a man and a woman, a this and a that, and they do this and they do that and they say this and they act this way and that's right. How is this any different? It's just a new rule, but did we think it through? And did you think it through for yourself? And do you accept it? Just, I don't care what they're doing. What do we want to do? How would we do this romance? Well, that's the thing, and I see that changing. And another thing that I see paradigm shifting is uh, not having to get married. Well, that's a relief. I mean, we don't have to worry. Well, that was about uh, protecting a child, legitimizing a child because of the whole bastard sure. and thing. So, um, and it was considered the correct protocol. I think to err to safety should I have wanted a family, I would have done it through the vehicle of marriage. Yeah. Just It was the, the safe choice, not offending anybody. My kids are starting off in the system of that thinking, and certainly that's an okay option. But mm -hmm. now we have so much more latitude, and it's just whatever works for you. Right. See, I like that because it's not how it was before where you're just, like, forced into this mold. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you... You uh, escaped a mold, right? <laughs> oh, definitely. And, you know, in some ways, I feel like my life um, started in this whole new path. You know, once I did, I, I was married for 20 years and I had my son and, we, you know, we were in Palo Alto. And so I just think it's so great that, you know, as awkward and horrible as it was, the breakup, um, my life changed significantly in a way that it never would have if I hadn't gone through with that breakup. I mean, I feel like um, some of the best things in my life have happened since then. I've traveled around the world and worked in 33 countries and enjoyed myself in a way that it just makes you open up to different kinds of living and meeting a lot of different kinds of people. And I heard you say that you've traveled a lot. It just changes your whole outlook on life. Well, you've had at least two dynamically different lives. Yes. And, and how wonderful that you've done the traditional, you have a son, you said just you, just one yeah. boy? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a son, you had the marriage, you had Palo Alto, you did yeah. that whole thing, yeah. you did well. And then you thought, okay, I'm done here. Okay, so yeah. now what? <laughs> exactly. You actually are living both worlds at the same time. Now, isn't this an interesting integration? I love I, that. But you have an option. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's beautiful. So we've hit another chapter. It's like you're reading a book. And with my own life, I didn't want to know the ending. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a culture in a time period where the ending was prescribed. I knew every chapter, every chapter title, go to the best schools, uh, <laughs> get the best husband, yeah. college simply an entree to more men. It's just, it's nice, but you, a woman doesn't need it. And then have beautiful children, live through your children, be active in junior league in the country club, manage many homes well. Uh, and I just thought, oh my God, I know <laughs> the ending of my book. So I thought, I, and I wanted a book that as I read the chapters, mm -hmm. I'm surprised. So first, and when I started living my truth, you know, I had the reaction of everybody around me, like, okay, such a nice girl, but why is she making that choice? <laughs> right? It could have been a lovely woman had she followed the could path. Could have been. <laughs> like, I deviated, but they, they kind of liked me. They didn't know what to do with me. Yeah, whatever. And then I, then I got to chapters where I shocked myself. I'm like, I can't even believe I did that. Yeah. I made that choice. And then sometimes I come back to the middle and sometimes I tread water and other times I just leap. And I, but at least it's interesting for me. I, I don't want to know the ending of my story. Exactly. Yeah, you know? this was so exciting that you can change in ways that you never even predicted or even thought of. But that's the cool thing. Now, there are people who don't want that. Yeah. They want this and this and this and not to make them bad or wrong right. any more then a stay-at-home mom shouldn't be made to feel guilty about it because other women are out working. If that's what you want, that's fine. Exactly. If you want to work, that's fine. If you want to do both, that's fine. If you want to be mm -hmm. married and, and in a heterosexual relationship and do that, that's fine. But it's also okay to make your own, I call it a la carte. I think you'll be seeing that, I, I just shot that, the a la carte relationship, but love oh. a la carte. I like that. So my methodology for that is to look to the traditional, mm -hmm. whatever formula, what pieces of your parents, your grandparents, traditional relationships do you think are so precious, mm -hmm. so beautiful? You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you're being selective. I want this. I want that. I don't like that. Don't like that at all. Not doing that. But I could kind of do this, but I can do it differently. And so when you start to create your own prototype, of how you want your relationship to be, then you're living authentically in what is your design. But it's well thought out. It's not haphazard. Well, so and I it's not so easy to be authentic either. I really? find. Oh, you mean not you being authentic? You mean how people react to your being authentic? Well, that's a good <laughs> point you just made because what I find is it is easier to be authentic as the older I get. Um, it doesn't always get the response <laughs> that I mean, yeah. I'm oftentimes very surprised by the response and amused. Um, but I realize that people don't always choose to to live that way. But that doesn't change that I'm not going to. But it's just interesting to see how being authentic can cause quite a few ripples. It It can. And we have to just hope that all these ripples add more colors and more movement to the entire ocean. Exactly. You're right. Because so everybody good. that is the, the front runner, you know, those first in the infantry line, whether <laughs> the women's right to vote yeah. or the couples of the same sex that were like, damn it, we are going to hold hands. You have a problem with that. I'm sorry. Anybody who has been the front runner of breaking through another level of expression has had to fight convention. Right. But I think we're at the point that convention is almost becoming unique in the world that I mean, I live more in a millennial world with most of my clients. Not, yeah. I mean, people of all ages, but most, for whatever reason, this older female's voice seems to resonate with the group that needs the most help with dating right now and relationships. But uh, so I start to think that being something definable and conventional will will become rare in 20 years. Definitely. Rather than, yeah, rather than fighting to have to be you, fighting for your right to be unique amongst a bunch of um, you know formulaic patterns. I think in time everything's going to be so 
individualized, almost like our cable television shows. How many channels do you have? I remember when we first had more than 26 channels, I they <laughs> heard this thing, you're going to have 600. And I remember thinking, the hell would you put on 600 stations? Oh, <laughs> it's endless. But in my mind, I'm thinking, what are you going to do, 600 stations? But, you know, I, I think we're just all finding our way in this time period where we've left tradition. We are questioning how much of it we want for ourselves, mm -hmm. our relationship, and we're also questioning, um, you know, what we what we want to create now with our life. That's right. Now, you said which group had the most questions about dating that you find? Well, well, well the ones that have the most question millennials. Millennials. Oh, that's computer. interesting. They're, I didn't think about that. Sitting in so you've got to realize we blew up the structures of, yeah. of romance in around 2000 when sex was free and it was casual. And it was outside of any kind of promise of relationship or emotional um, responsibility. You have to realize the whole world kind of went wacky because yeah. you torn down the structure. And it, these, unfortunately, they haven't created much of an infrastructure yet, which is why they're hunting and pecking. And that's okay. But, you know, an infrastructure is definitely necessary. It, uh, when you leave an old model, you can't just blow up a city and go, well, now we're all free because now you've got to create a new city, a better version of that. But you need some tangible things that are cohesive that to, to, to make people grounded and feel safe in this new experience that's very important i think well so we're all really finding our way like i i love that you made that point because there isn't really a model anymore i think that's why you know i i love what you're doing so much because it gives people the room to find out what they really want and to give themselves the options that they didn't even give themselves before that's right you know for many people the idea that they have a choice hmm is completely radical. And for other people, this seems normal, depending upon, like to a 20 year old, of course this seems normal, of course I have choice. <laughs> so it's so interesting to have these generations living together, working side by side, mm -hmm. as society's fabric shifts. And so when you've blown up a structure, you need infrastructure. Once that infrastructure is in place and it becomes antiquated, it'll be blown up again and tested just like the 60s tested our our american country you know the ideology mm -hmm. tested it, the 70s tested it uh it's just the structures will change as the people change but the same is true in love and romance so there's one fundamental safety net i can give everybody as a takeaway okay. is that you get to create what you want it only takes your clarity of knowing what you want and how you want it to begin the dialogue and the mission statement. Now, you may meet people who hear what you want to create, hear how you see it, and they're like, yeah, not really my thing. Okay, right. for the next. You know, but, but we, do, we don't have to take what's given to us. And if you don't have an opinion and people don't know what they want and people haven't figured out the type of interaction they want, they'll be relegated to getting what somebody's going to give them. Yeah. Might as well be 20 again and not know what you're doing, you know? Well, yeah. And, you know, part of this, too, is saying no to what you don't want. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I... Like, you know, for me, um, having that physical attraction is so important. And if I don't feel that, I don't, it's I can't do, I can't have a date. I know, I know, but that's an important part of sexuality. You got to get all over that thing. You got to like it. You've got to be attracted to it. Mm -hmm. Unless there is some pre-existing condition that necessitates you bond with that person to protect your family, to take care of your kids. It's the only person with food and water, so I'll mate with them. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. You have an incentive, right? Okay. So if you had an incentive, if we lived in a in a community, a rural community of three hundred people, and there were three guys within my, that were single within an agreeable <laughs> age range, I would have to make a selection, right? <laughs> then back to your original question. Yeah. I, figuring out I wouldn't be settling, I would be making a rational choice. 
as to what's reasonable. Well, that's very practical advice. I like that. And I, you know, I got, I, this made me think of one more thing. It's about differences with money. And that's such a big issue. Um, it is. And people think it's not spiritual to talk about it. It's not polite. Money counts. Right. But more so as you get older and more so, more so in, I shouldn't say as you get older, I think perhaps a vagabond lifestyle might have been cool at 18 or 20. I could sleep on the floor. I could sleep in a in a in a um, sleeping bag on a mountain that's kind of rubbly, and I thought it was cool to travel <laughs> country. But I'm older now. I want to go first class, or I want to at least go in a seat that leans back. I want to go to a hotel that's just as nice as my house. Yeah, I to know that the water as I wash my face is not going to give me microbes. Right. I, and not see blood on the on the carpet and be told it's a four star hotel mm -hmm. according to that country's rating, but you know, money money does money does alter things. It does or resources money resources. Well, it's hard to be pro pragmatic because there's so many choices, but you know it kind of gets down to what feels. I don't know what what you would say about this, but it seems what feels comfortable, like especially when you're dating. Like who pays for what and oh yeah, oh uh, yeah. It's an issue, and it can be a bigger issue once you get into a relationship. I know it was a it, an issue in my own marriage, so I thought I'd oh. bring that up because it doesn't get talked about that much. Well, interestingly enough, in in the archetype of marriage, mm -hmm. you would think that would have been the man's responsibility. That's a traditional model, and then as a couple, you pool your resources. Mm -hmm. But dating you would have been. The burden would have been on him to entertain you, to fluff up his feathers and show you that he's the best, <laughs> the best bird in the whole forest. You know, right? To make right. money. If you're dating a younger man, yeah, women have to get very smart with the fact that if you're 40 dating a 20 year old, get comfortable with cafeteria food because he might not be able to take you out. He hasn't had his first job. If he's just gotten into his first job, he may have you know, uh, a bill for schooling, you right. know, you have all this student loan that he has to take care of. So be thoughtful and don't say, Hey honey, I want to go to the Caribbean to this five-star hotel because he can't do that. Right. And don't pay for him either. For heaven's sake, you've got to work it out. Couples work it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what I wanted to hear. Cause that's such a sticky thorny kind of topic sometimes. So do you have a specific example? Well, um, I, yeah, there's like, uh, some, so it's a, a younger guy and a woman that I know. And so there's one person that, well, okay. So the, the woman has more freedom to do more traveling and, and going places and, and the other, and the guy doesn't. So that's what, and I think that can happen a lot. I've seen this, um with with people that I know and you know how to resolve that because you know that's not everything but it is something it's practical uh does well this could have looked like a traditional stay-at-home mom and a husband that travels the world for business that has an exalted life exactly so the, the, the problem, one, is it financial? Is it that she would prefer to take him on some of these trips or does she have to, does she have to travel alone or pay for him completely? Yeah, because it's not, that's not possible to do either. So it kind of comes yeah. down to, well, then it can't happen. Well, maybe you don't do it together, but then you have to find something together. Mm -hmm. She can have her private time to live her expanded life with greater resources mm -hmm. He can be encouraged to do the things that give him pleasure, and they do things together that don't involve that. Oh, okay, that's I, good. I would look for a I would look for a third thing. If he is younger, needs to stay tethered to a job because he's building up his empire, building up, or he's running hard with his career. You can't ask him to stop if the lady has more free time and more money. Right. So that would be that would be a power imbalance in that one financial area. So as the woman with money, I would pick and choose what things I would ask him for which to accompany me that I'd pay for. If oh, I, want, okay. I want him there for my pleasure and my joy, and okay. I think he'll enjoy it and he won't feel uncomfortable receiving it, Okay, 
I would judiciously choose the right things and the right events, maybe for his birthday, maybe for my birthday, for something special. I think it's a real trap as the woman who has the money and the power to be paying for your guy, not just because it, it but it sets a precedent yeah. of feeling uh, emasculated. Right. And that's why, he yeah. Wants to be the guy. He wants to, even if it's to take you to a movie and buy the popcorn, if that's his max, that is your date. Yeah. And that's exactly what I was talking about because it isn't like, it's just like so much wealth on the female side. It's more like um yeah you don't want it, 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 there isn't this feeling of uh emasculating that seems to happen because i have i have noticed this with um you know disparity in income levels yes. with friends and everyone so i wanted to ask about that because it's you know with dating it's even more crucial i think you have to figure out if you're dating somebody from a vastly different economic realm that might limit you, meaning you're the one with more resources. You might want to look at where money plays less of a role in your being united, what's fun for you, that's yeah. doable for both. And if you're the one without resources, mm -hmm. you have to find to what degree are you able to participate in your mate's world without feeling some a bit of inferior, I don't belong here, oh, they're just taking to show me off, or, you know, what am I going to owe them now for taking me to this? And and will it <laughs> me? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. She took you to Hawaii, and I took you to Spain, and then you did this and this, and I asked you to wash the car, and you didn't. Yeah, but, you know, so it can get into that. So I, I yeah, think to find yeah. things that are experiential, that have less to do with the money, fun things that the couple can do together, where... It's not in that moment about money. Okay, because, you know, being on, I've been on both sides of that, and I just feel like, gosh, how do you get, but that's good advice, to just have the focus elsewhere. And this is one of those areas where we sometimes have a great relationship, and then we start to feel the little fibers being pulled at the edges. It's starting to weaken its weave, because we need to be in a relationship where there is a sense of balance and harmony mm -hmm. where the, the challenges and the differences are great enough to inspire us. Yeah. But not so extreme as to somehow rock our sense of security or safety on either end of that financial spectrum or the resource spectrum. So, you know, um, it's kind of like, uh, like buying a party dress. You know, or okay, I, a better That's description. Good. If you had a pair of jeans, you know, okay. jeans shopping for a woman because we have all we have all all over the place. So there's a lot <laughs> into a pair of jeans, and every woman's got her thing, right? So when you get a pair of jeans, they can't they you don't want them to just look good. You want them to feel good, and then mm. you have to figure mm -hmm. out: Am I wearing the dressy ones? Is this for work? So it, the the same thing is true in a partner, male or female. You know, the overall functionality of that partner. You don't want a partner that feels like a scratchy party dress. Right. You don't want a partner that's so casual that you feel like, oh, I can never go anyplace nice in this. <laughs> so you, you're looking for somebody somewhat within the dimension of where you flow. I mean, I think a great quality, um, this diversity. I have a friend who, well, he's world travel, lived all over the world, speaks five languages. He's my greatest guy friend. And so he just has this ability. He could sit down, get a curb, any curb on a block in downtown Phoenix where there are illegals trying to get work, waiting around to be hired. He could sit down, have a cup of coffee with them in their language, laugh and have the best time. And that evening, go to the Ritz-Carlton to a black tie affair and be speaking French or English to somebody and be just as comfortable. So his, his realms of diverse cultural and social interaction are awesome. Yeah. We pray for these things in a mate. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you don't. You know, sometimes you don't need that much. It's yeah. all at different times in our lives. But if it if it basically functions well, I'd look for the things where whatever our issue is does not our issue isn't activated in that realm. And where can we come closer? Oh, that's a good way. That's very good advice. Yeah, I like that. That's great. Thank you, Susan. You're wonderful. Yes.
I gotta come see you when I'm in San Francisco. We have to exchange numbers when we're off the off this Absolutely. call. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. What's the best what way to get stay in touch with you? I have your Skype and your phone number showed up. Um, but I don't have your email. Oh, I will give you all that when we're off the air. Oh, right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Susan, for joining me. And I know my people are going to love this and your people will love it. And it's just been they such will, an opportunity. Love there. Thank you. I like you so much. Can I just say that? Oh, thank what a you. great vibe you have. Oh, what a lovely, lovely woman. I just, wow. You know, sometimes you forget they're out there. And I'm sorry if we forgot about you. We had such a nice time talking to each other, but... You know, what a great, I can't wait to meet you in person. I can't wait. That's just how I feel too. I'm like, oh my God, you're going to be down the street. Listen, if you have even any bit of time, let me know. And to we'll, my friend. Okay. I'm on her schedule. Is, I know, but I'll be thinking about you. I'm not that far away. Okay. So we may just work this out. We'll okay. do this. All, okay. I would love to meet you. That'd be so great. Thank this has been you. so much fun. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Mary. My best to you. Thanks a lot. I'll be seeing you real soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.